Hey, and welcome to the Amber Data Podcast. I'm Chris Martin, analytics engineer at Amber Data. I'm joined today with Nakul Gupta. Uh, Nakul, you have a extremely long history in crypto and uh, a wonderful history beyond that. Can you do me a favor and uh, save me from butchering your your experience? <laughs> uh, give I'm us really a, a, an intro. Having me on this podcast, Martin, I'm excited to you know dive in. So so yeah, I'm Nakul. I'm the uh, you know chief business officer here at Grind. Uh, we are a cross chain or the book Dex built on Starkware. You know, starting with the Ethereum ecosystem. Uh, and I joined just more recently, and uh, you know, I was actually a seed investor, so I had seen the founders and the company kind of you know grow to where it is today. And, uh, you know, hence uh, kind of chose to, you know, start the journey uh, with them. Um, yeah, and I recently left Coinbase where I was looking after, you know, all things Coinbase Prime, uh, you know, activation, onboarding growth, which, uh, you know, is the flagship product for institutional trading and custody at Coinbase. So, you know, spent the last two years there. Uh, pretty, pretty, you know, amazing experience uh, kind of looking at, you know, various aspects of kind of institutions and how to think about, you know, crypto and how we can kind of ease them into it. And prior to that, uh, you know, was at PayPal or, or Venmo for a few years, helping launch Venmo Crypto with Paxos, working on open banking initiatives with Plaid, Yodli, and, you know, doing a bunch of other kind of zero to one initiatives like the like the business profile we launched. So, yeah, I've been an operator in the space, you know, for, for the last, uh, you know, four to five years. And, um, and yeah, more than that, you know, I love to also write, you know, like you guys, I like to kind of disseminate knowledge in this space. So, you know, I write at uh, my Substack called Triptechy, which now reaches 23,000 subscribers. And yeah, I've also been an angel in this space. So I've invested in over 30 Web3 projects and um, and yeah, helping founders, you know, see to Series A. So excited to, you know, continue to kind of invest in, in the most promising teams and companies out there. So that's a little bit about me. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Cryptechy. And I think that's sort of when I reached out to you was when I read uh, some of your blog posts. Um, we'll, we'll get into those in a bit. Um, uh, but how did you, you get into the crypto space? Uh, was this, uh, you know, 27 ICO boom or, uh, more recently? Yeah. So I think the first time I got, you know, more into it was, uh, my time spent at Chicago booth, uh, you know, in 2017 when, uh, the classes has actually just started, you know, I was more of a FinTech person then because, you know, back in India, I was doing a bunch of work in FinTech. So, so that naturally made me very curious about kind of money movement and, you know, all things kind of, uh, you know, fintech. So when I came to Booth, uh, classes in cryptocurrency had just started, you know, with the uh, professors and Gallus kind of leading one course. And that got me really curious into, you know, Bitcoin and, uh, you know, the white paper and, and and was really fascinated by how, you know, money is just, you know, your belief or, or what you believe in it and it can actually be decentralized. So I think those concepts kind of stayed with me. But when I was working with Venmo, I think the, the practical application of it really kind of astounded me that everyone was there to create like wall gardens, right? Like you couldn't really move money from Venmo to Cash App to PayPal. Everyone was just creating their own set of 100 million, the next 100 million users. And there was no fungibility. You know, the money movement still was slow and relied on traditional rails and realized that everyone's kind of innovating on top of the stack that already exists, which is, uh, you know, which is, has its own limitations. And no one's really rethought this from the ground up for the, you know, how this would look like for the next hundred years, right? Like there's no 10X there, it was just incremental innovation. And kind of when DeFi, you know, summer happened and things started happening in Venmo, I, you know, during my time at Venmo, I really realized the the the, the practical nature of, you know, use cases that could emerge from there. And yeah, that just uh, got bitten by the bug. And since then, you know, I uh, learned a lot more about crypto. Yeah, I think that's a that's a great use case too. Is uh, remittances and, and payments generally? Uh, do you think we're we're there yet from the crypto side in, in payments? I think payments are super interesting, and we'll you know touch upon that uh, a lot more. I think there's some very obvious use cases where you know payments is broken. So I think uh, the couple of things here: payments is an extremely you know uh, regional business and regulated business, right? And and more than kind of the the tech innovation itself i think what it really needs is the right regulatory compliance kind of framework given you know it's, it's money movement and at the end of the day everyone's evolved differently you know given the geography constraints so china you know kind of centralize it uh in, in in some ways uh i mean there's obviously the you know private world of wechat which controls you know most of the users there in india you know the government-led push led to kind of a common digital identity because of which you know payment platform could be built in the US, that hasn't really happened, and which is why we see, you know, the banking crisis today and a lot of the things that are happening and unfolding. 
But I think in terms of payment trails, I think, you know, they have been extremely centralized over time with, you know, extreme reliance on the, the four or the five party, you know, structure that exists, which, you know, everyone seeks a certain rent in terms of acquiring fees or merchant fees. And I think crypto can truly, like if someone were to compete against that kind of entrenched five party structure with vested interests and give more power back and, you know, take rates, that could actually be crypto. And, and we'll definitely dive in and speak of, you know, use cases such as, uh, especially like, you know, high risk payments, right? If you're trying to gamble or, or you know, uh, even use payments on only fans, like it's, it's, uh, it's, it's kind of uh, appalling as to how, you know, the, the value flows in that ecosystem. Yeah, that, those are really good points. Um, let's change gears and, and talk about Brian. Um, you, you mentioned it earlier. What is Brian? Yeah, absolutely happy to go through that. So, so Brian is an order book based decentralized exchange, uh, which is the EVM compatible. And we really chose to build in the Starkware ecosystem, especially with StarkX to solve for scaling. So we offer both UI based and API trading in a non-custodial way, which is scalable, uh, instant execution, gasless, and fully decentralized. So the user you know, has 100% control over his or assets all the time. So, so we're backed by Pantera, uh, Starkware, Elevation Capital, you know, Sequoia, Spartan, and, and, uh, and you know, multiple other kind of Web3 VC funds who chose to believe in us. And our value prop is, is uh, you know, uh, while we're obviously catering to the retail uh, traders, we also are geared towards institutional and high frequency trading and also provide, you know, best in class liquidity management through our order book DEX APIs. So, uh, so yeah, so those are some of the, you know, uh, kind of, uh, you know, value prop of, of Brian. So, so how does Brian work, um, or more, how does Brian differ from the larger DEXs out there like Uniswap, SushiSwap? Absolutely. So, there are a couple of you know things that are a little bit unique about Brian. So, one is we are built for scale and speed, uh, and uh, you know that comes from the order book nature of it versus the AMM you know uh, nature of Uniswap and others, whereas. You know, there's slippage and then, you know, uh, there's front running an MEV. So within, uh, you know, Brian, uh, uh, we solve for this through multiple ways. So because we, you know, are able to uh, scale through the, the L2's solution of Starkware, we can actually support TPS of up to 600K with instant order finality, right? So if you're in Uniswap or some of the other DEXs, you will see, you know, often latency being higher, especially if you the larger trades you place, you can you know, face some more slippage and front running, right? Uh, the second is, I think, complete privacy on your trading positions, you know, thanks to ZK knowledge proof. So I think, uh, you know, some of the trades, like we mentioned, you know, bots can come and see what's happening in the mempool and try to front run you. And also, you know, uh, by nature of it, everything is public. So, um, so, so you do get, you know, that layer of privacy, especially for, you know, institutional trading um, uh, because of our kind of, you know, uh, underlying tech. And some of the other benefits, you know, other than scale, speed, uh, privacy, also comes with the fact that we align incentives and pricing structures really well, which means that, uh, you know, Uniswap, for example, would be a blended fees of 0.3%, and Brian is at 0.1%, and we also offer referral rebates. So if you're a trader on Brian, and if you bring, let's say, three of your friends, you actually earn 50% of the revenue of their trades going forward, right? So there's a really good kind of uh, incentive mechanism for you to do so. And, uh, you know, essentially you can think of it as a decentralized order book exchange for traders, built by traders, trying to provide the best in class onboarding and experience. And that's just one of the products we have. We're also launching SaveGate, which is our MPC, uh, you know, based wallet solution for institutions, uh, you know, uh, with native account abstraction. So yeah, just some of the, you know, uh, uh, things that we want to do as, as we see some gaps in the DeFi ecosystem and want to become, you know, the easiest kind of solution to, to uh, you know, onboard to uh, with so so I think in summary I would say it's almost like it feels like a centralized exchange with all the benefits, but under the hood it's it's decentralized and and that's kind of the you know the value prop we're trying to bridge the gap between the two worlds. Yeah, that that's really interesting. I I think it, you nailed the uh, on the head, which is taking CFI mechanisms, applying them to DeFi, right? Um, with with managing the order books, is there a natural step to let's say OTC trading? So yeah, I think uh, we're going to you know be doing a lot more you know uh, to cater to the needs of the traders. So I think uh, over time, as we 
uh, you know, become the leader in spot trading market. We're going to, you know, think about other things like derivatives or perpetuals options. You know, that's one route. The other is obviously the OTC route. I think a lot of this predicates on having, you know, the right uh, kind of, you know, user set and uh, liquidity on board. And once we have that, I think we can do a lot more to to further the ecosystem, especially I think, you know, with OTC, there's an interesting opportunity uh, on the, you know, um, on the institutional side. And I think with institutions, one of the big trends we've seen is, you know, if you speak to most of the CD5 apps or, you know, institutions out there, given that most of the liquidity is still with centralized exchanges, they have to depend on OB APIs or Binance APIs to source liquidity. And the challenge is, you know, the counterparty risk, the collateral and credit lines you need to take. So there's a lot of risk that's tied with them uh, that they tie into custodial, you know, count, uh, counterparties like those. And what we're really trying to say is that you don't need to, right? You, you can actually do this while owning your crypto assets all the time. And that's the premise, you know, where I think uh, we're trying to do this in a way that's more efficient through the order books, but also you know, getting them to manage their own crypto on their books. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Um, I'm I'm want to dive into more of the investment strategy and research stuff. Um, and we can talk about uh, Cryptechie, these really great blog posts, uh, specifically uh, Web three and how to invest in DeFi first principles. Uh, these are these are the, my most two referenced <laughs> blog posts. Um, so. Can you talk about the the insights that you have in our current environment right now? Um, we'll come back to more details on these these blog posts, but I'm curious to get your thoughts on where we're at uh, in in the current environment. What kind of trends are we seeing? What sort of phase are we in? Yeah, absolutely. So I think uh, to be honest, like there's a reset in crypto every few years, right? Where there's a bull cycle and the bear cycle. And, you know, you'll hear the same messages around here, build during the bear cycles and then wait for the pump to happen. I think you know, that's kind of the, the, the stereotype. But I think uh, overall, if you really peel underneath the layers and see, you know, what's really happening is uh, there, there are a couple of meta trends, right? One is the builders who are really excited about the space, uh, you know, who have been here for a while, continue to invest here versus, you know, let's say, uh, obviously we've seen a lot of shakedown of the job market, you know, with PMs and engineers from a lot of the larger, you know, fangs kind of coming in. So I think what this has done is kind of created this trough of disillusionment where, you know, people who truly want to research and build deeper into crypto stay. And 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 because of that, I think we're seeing a lot more interesting kind of trends on uh, unfold because people are, you know, A, managing burn rate and going really deep in crypto and spending some more time there. Uh, and because of that, I think, you know, the multiple areas that are coming out to be to be really interesting, which, you know, I think folks are doubling down on. For example, you know, one is, uh, uh, you know, zero knowledge proofs and the underlying tech behind it as to how that can, you know, be applied in various kind of use cases. So um, uh, even, you know, concepts like homomorphic encryption, which means that how do you kind of, you know, look at encrypted data uh, and try to decrypt it without even uh, and, and try to kind of see what's underneath without decrypting it, you know. So, so this has been there for the last few decades, but enough progress hasn't been made on this. So, I think concepts like you know uh, zk are really interesting because they really help compress a lot of you know data into into a single you know check that can be done on the header. And really, uh, you know, while right now they're computationally expensive, over time you will see you know there with the Moore's law coming into place. If if those become really efficient, we'll actually see a fundamental shift where you know, as you look at Robinhood and a lot of these other, you know, brokerages, uh, there's a lot of inefficiency that goes behind the T plus two settlement and other things. So you could actually put a lot of assets, you know, liquid assets or securities, other things on chain and really bring the benefits of DeFi, which is really, you know, uh, as simple as 24 seven global permissionless, you know, uh, to, to some of these asset classes, right? And that ties into the real world asset use cases and some other things. So I think that's one, you know, meta trend that, you know, I continue to be excited about. Um, and then I think we spoke about payments earlier. So, you know, one simple use case is high risk payments, where if you really look at, for example, you know, a lot of innovation obviously happens from adult content, online gaming, you know, those areas are ripe for kind of innovation. But only fans like charges creators 20%, pays out 12 to 13% to payment processors, right? And the companies, uh, for example, gaming payment processor charge 5 to 15% per transaction, Steam charges 30%. So I think uh, I'm, I'm very interested in kind of 
streamlining, uh, like one of the biggest principles on crypto is alignment of incentives, right? And, and coordination that couldn't happen before now happens because of incentive alignment. So I think crypto in many ways just solves a coordination and an incentive alignment problem. And we will see some of that with, you know, uh, payments, for example, high-risk payments where a company, let's say like passes, is building a suite of tools that enables creators to engage with their fans and uses crypto rails where they can actually, they have to pay 0% for crypto, for payments over crypto rails and sharing, sharing those savings with creators, right? What Blur did, let's say in the NFT space by hijacking, you know, uh, and doing a vampire attack on, on OpenSea. So I think uh, those are also kind of interesting meta trends around uh, alignment of you know monetization, alignment of kind of you know I mean solving the coordination pro- problem through crypto. Uh, how we are seeing that with Eigenlayer, you know, trying to become the the, the you know uh, Ethereum kind of reputation marketplace. Uh, so so I think uh, what's really interesting overall is we have this fundamental layer of L ones. Uh, which you know have now the trust and the reputation and have existed for the last you know decades or so, and now there's a ton of trust protocols or trust marketplaces being built on top of it, which I think uh, you know just go back and take away a lot of the uh, you know uh, kind of centralization forces we've seen in, in various parts of the world. So yeah, really excited about that. Um, do you see uh, protocols continuing a race to the bottom, uh, where computation is improved, uh, efficiencies are improved? Um, do you see exchanges, for example, or or DeFi lending protocols reducing fees over time? Yeah, I think what's really interesting here is, um, you know, uh, there are many markets, like there is inherent centralization of, of power, right? So, for example, today, if actually we see that most of the borrowing or lending concentrates on Aave compound, and let's say they become one of the protocols where it gets more and more efficient, to your point, like, at some point, they have a tiering structure of ways that you, they only run on kind of the minimal amount required to sustain their treasuries and users. I feel that eventually those are the best models because even though a lot of the power is concentrated, let's say with someone like our RV or a compound, uh, right over time, hopefully there's sufficient decentralization that no one person can really control the, uh, you know, uh, the protocol. And all of it is really co- encoded in smart contracts in a way you know, that that cannot be uh, kind of uh, disrupted by a few centralized parties. And the, the challenge is today, uh, that is not true from, nine, let's say, 95% of the protocols out there. But I think progressive decentralization is where we're, you know, headed towards, right? Bitcoin and Ethereum took a while to get there. But I do believe that in a world where there is a race to the bottom and, you know, let's say the Uniswaps of the world and others, like, suck in all the liquidity. Uh, I think uh, I think it has to be truly, you know, kind of uh, um, net some positive for the ecosystem versus, you know, one party trying to kind of take in, you know, uh, the take rate. Because classically, you've seen Uber and DoorDash being going to take all and then, you know, increase the take rates, right? So I think that's that's the that's the premise that crypto doesn't kind of get us to the same stage. Mm-hmm. On, on a personal level, when, when you participate in investment rounds, uh, not so much as a token holder, but as uh, a you know, seed investor or investing in a round from a, from a startup, what sort of areas are you more or less interested in? Yeah. So I think some of the areas that I'm uh, most interested in are crypto infrastructure or web three infrastructure. We'll see, you know, a lot of uh, uh, investments that are made there. The second one uh, is obviously, you know, DeFi, uh, especially, you know, focused on, um, uh, Kind of bringing more efficiency and liquidity into the ecosystem, um, and then finally, uh, uh, some of the B two B use cases, uh, you know, in 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 uh, crypto, for example, you know, bet on companies that are providing better SaaS tooling, like you know, accounting, tax, and other infra. So I think those are a few themes that you know uh, are are kind of exciting. And then obviously, I always kind of leave some room for moonshots, uh, you know, companies that. Uh, you know, are, are very novel in their approach and how they're approaching the space. And, and when you evaluate these um, services, tools, companies, what sort of data do you use or what sort of metrics? Do you have any standard metrics that you look at? Are they specific to the industry? How often do you do you revisit these, these sets? Yeah, so I think uh, the... There's some common set of metrics that apply to you know most of these, whether it's you know L1, you know payment trail, a DeFi DApp, or you know uh, so some of them are the first bucket is 
your users traction and monetization, which really, you know, is, is your standard metrics around TVL, active user growth, right? Uh, the second one, which I think is tricky, depending on the stage of the project is monetization, which here I think can have multiple flavors to it, right? It could be supply side revenue, uh, which, you know, goes to liquidity providers or protocol revenue or even treasury growth. Uh, or even the ability, like LiFi, for example, you know, I recently invested in these guys and uh, for them, I think, you know, a lot of the monetization will come from, uh, you know, have being the predominant way that you swap asset A to B, right? So, so you have to believe in, in a certain thesis for us to kind of get there. Um, and then I think the second bucket is just, you know, uh, the, the trading activity, uh, the community development. I think the Team Plus ecosystem is pretty big, right? So, so do they have an act, active ecosystem of developers? You know, who's on their kind of team? Uh, I think that's you know the the uh, the second kind of big big bucket. And then obviously we go to you know other ones. For example, as you go into you know very specific things like AMM and others, you're looking at you know specific metrics like you know slippage and others. If you go to order book, you're looking at bid ask spreads and you know how good they are. So I think uh, overall. It's very different if you look at an early stage company. I think it anchors on the team and kind of the market potential. But as you go a little bit later stage, I think oftentimes you have a lot of the metrics, especially around tokenomics. You know how the unlocks are happening and um, and and some of those kind of value accrual metrics. I think those are the ones that you know uh, I I kind of focus on a lot more. Yeah, that that makes sense. In terms of uh, monetization, do you think that there's an inherent difference between crypto companies and traditional tech firms. So, for example, um, you know, with a crypto company, you can see profits immediately. You can trace these protocol fees uh, in any transaction. But with traditional tech companies, they constantly run at a loss. Even several public companies continue to run at losses for years. Is there an inherent difference? Yeah, I 100% believe so. I think the two things that are different, I think one is distribution, right? Because most Web2 companies spend a bunch on distribution and, you know, the LTV CAG that's promised, you know, in the fundraise might not translate later on. So I think Web3 companies are trying to flip that by building the community first. Uh, and some are actually, you know, accruing a lot of value day one. So I think, uh, for example, if you look at business models of various DeFi protocols, right? You have kind of matchmakers, uh, right? Like Uniswap and Aave we discussed, which essentially just depend, you know, the Uniswap code is just out there, right? And and Uniswap is not really, right now their operating costs, I'm guessing are super duper low, but they created this engine where, you know, LPs and others can just come and, and you know, through, the op- through this open source code, which is easily forkable, kind of match each other, right? So so the margins that are kind of high, you can assume because, you know, there's, there's not that much cost of running this. Uh, and then you have like service providers like InstaDAP, Zapier. Now these are dApps that obviously, you know, will have to do some marketing, especially wallets, right? And then there are very few that have scaled like MetaMask, you know, which may be at a hundred million revenue run rate. So that becomes more of a distribution play, right? Like wallets don't make uh, that much money unless you have a lot of distribution. So, you know, typically, you know, you don't want a lot of funded wallets throwing a lot of money at users to, to, to get them in. So I think those are kind of, you know, different... Uh, Ball game, and then finally you have asset managers, right? Which, for example, your Yearn or Convex, where you can just manage users' funds and then uh, you know have a lot of kind of yield-based mm-hmm. incentives. So I think DeFi models, the, the beauty of them is you can actually the the one I believe mostly is in only charge the user when you can provide some value, right? Uh, and take some percentage of that value because you provided that extra value. So I think in DeFi that actually. Given the healthy competition, a lot of times that comes, you know, true where uh, you're able to actually do uh, either matchmaking, you know, be an asset manager, provide a service, be a liquidity, you know, partner, and then tie your monetization very closely to the service you're providing, and which is why you know you'll see kind of very few people succeed uh, in terms of network effects they create and the outside value they create. So I think it's a it's a very interesting model versus Web two model where, where where you have to wait a lot of time, get a lot of users on board. And, hopefully, and hope to God that they don't churn and create the LTV that, you know, you want them to. So I think it's a little bit different, you know, in, in the DeFi space. Yeah. And, and you said it a couple of times. So I'm curious to dig in a bit more. Uh, what is the power of community in this space? Yeah. So I think community is a tricky one, right? Because um, to be honest, I think it's really hard because most of the people are here for, uh, you know, kind of making a quick buck, uh, right? Which you can't really follow them because you know, that's how most nascent industries develop. So right now everyone's in it to see 
how we can flip an NFT or how we can, you know, catch the next meme coin or uh, how we can do like 10 actions on, on a certain DAP so that they reward us, you know, in a way that, uh, you know, gives us a good ROI. I think uh, all of these mechanisms are just to get the adoption, right? Which I think like in my mind, if we abstract all this away, I think the users over time, you know, some will get burned, some will make money. I think, but but net net, if you look at the space, I think we need a way for people for 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 adoption to be driven and network effects to be created, right? For example, today, like you're going to your bank and borrowing, you know, there's so many people who rel- let's say relied on First Republic for deposits, right? And if you actually look look at let's say Ondo Finance or Maple and these others, why won't you, for example, go to them where they can issue proof of reserves and you know borrow or lend? or, you know, invest in kind of, you know, on-chain assets to them, right? Uh, so I think for that to happen, the community or users have to kind of go through the cycle of, you know, incentivization. They have to kind of have, have really good ex- user experiences, right? So so a lot of companies are trying to create that right now, that gateway to, you know, a bridge between Web2 and Web3. So I think uh, while that happens, this community development is really important because we want people to be engaged try out a different thing, you know, give feedback, say, hey, this bridge doesn't work, you know, maybe like, you know, so so I think while this is happening, we're going through this kind of entire, uh, you know, uh, chasm of, of user trial and error and feedback, you know, loop. And finally, I think out of this, you know, in, a, in let's say five or 10 years, really good kind of companies will emerge where I think, you know, users will instantly realize the benefits, right? They will kind of be able to now park assets or own yield or do things that they do in the track five world. But all the benefits of you know owning their own assets and not being tied to you know what's happening in the tried fight ecosystem. So I think uh, uh, overall that's that's the importance of community here, where we'll initially be disillusioned a little bit, but over time see the benefits of getting these users you know excited about about new technologies. So talking about bridges, what are your thoughts between L ones and L twos? Is it important for users to know the difference between uh, an L one or L two from their end? You know they're still interacting on chain. Does it really make a difference? Yeah, I mean for the user, like even the on chain world doesn't matter, right? I mean, if you're talking about the average user, user which is let's say my, you know, uh, my mom or my dad or you know your kind of siblings, I think if if those are average users not in crypto at all, uh, I think for them uh, nothing should really matter. What is on chain? What is Ethereum? Essentially for them. You know, I just take the example of a company that I bet on, you know, Kid Lab, which is doing NFT ticketing, right? You're used to purchasing your tickets on Live Nation or otherwise. So you should just have a similar platform and you should just be issued your ticket. Now, as a user, what you really care about is, hey, Live Nation and others don't actually allow me uh, to, you know, re or sell my ticket or transfer it easily and make it fungible. They don't allow me to actually, you know, as a, as a uh, stadium owner, I actually don't know who the user is, I can't target them, Live Nation takes 30%. So for the user into the stadium, like being in crypto or being on someone like KidLive means that the user can actually fungibly transfer it or send it to anyone and they can do it through their, you know, the ways they actually know about, like just a wallet to wallet transfer. And for the stadium owner, they can actually say, hey, I'm actually able to get royalties on each transfer or know who the ultimate user is, uh, right? So I think uh, that's the best analogy I would use for let's say web two versus web three, where the web two user uh, doesn't know that the underlying rail that an NFT has been created on Polygon and minted and transferred as a ticket. And there's some sort of track and trace and kind of incentive alignment behind the scenes, right? Which passes on better royalties back to the to the stadium owners and kind of breaks the monopoly and the, the challenge that you know Live Nation offers on both sides. And and I think I think that's where crypto will succeed, right? More of these use cases where the user actually doesn't know anything about L1, L2, Ethereum, any of this, but can do these actions that they typically do. And and essentially all they care about is, hey, can I can I make can I sell this ticket? Can I you know get more royalties? You know, as a as a stadium owner, and and those are the things that you know eventually kind of make sense. Yeah, I I totally get that. Um, what are your thoughts on audits in general? Um, like, do you take into consideration uh, the different audits that a protocol uses? Uh, for example, like if we talk about Euler, Euler had, I believe, nine different audits, but they were still hacked. Given the the hack was extremely sophisticated, but what are your thoughts in general on audits and incentive alignment? I think the challenge with audits is, you know, as follows. I think one is, uh, you know. Uh, the best audits can be done in the design phase itself when you're trying to design, you know, uh, 
the the solution or the protocol or the dap and the challenge is there's not enough you know obviously there's ways like you know bug bounties and kind of you know a little bit more on the design audit side but the challenge is most of the industry today relies on audits after you know they've actually coded right and especially right now like if you look at codes and other things i think this it's just so complex and hard to audit that often times like you know they're just doing some back tests or doing things that you know and these audits are really expensive so it, you know it just takes a few weeks so in a few weeks you know uh, a bunch of like you know folks looking at the the audit report or uh, looking at the code i think it's not doing ju- enough justice for the amount of tvl and amount of kind of importance that you know some of these protocols have and hence i think that there's a you know and you know here also i bet on some players like zelic for that for that matter you know who are taking a different approach to this and you know have a much more sharper way of doing audit but the but the reality is right now all the audit shops are you know uh, just uh, 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 shops with you know few developers or you're throwing people at the problem right there's no good ways of, of right now like kind of looking at you know uh, uh, ways that you can look at fuzzers or look at the code and actually while you design the code there's you know a lot of let's say you know unit tests or regression tests or others running in the background like how they happen in web2 So I think there'll be a lot more innovation there, which you know, already we see with a ton of cybersecurity and web three kind of security companies. So yeah, so just to answer your question, I think today audits is not in the phase where we want them to be, and as manual, it's you know not maybe done at the right stage. But we will start seeing a lot more innovation at the code development stage itself, where you know these bugs or these design flaws can be captured before. Versus right now they're not design led; they're more kind of you know vulnerability testing, you know post shipping, which is you know not ideal. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, when it comes to token investing, uh, do you have a different type of uh, thinking when it comes to something like a governance token versus maybe like a gas token or um, you know a protocol token? Do you think about governance token in a different way? Yeah, definitely. I think uh, you know governance tokens. To be honest, makes sense when. you know there is a very real thing to govern or you know the, the protocol has become big enough and we need decentralization right in my mind i think governance tokens inherently should not be speculative should not you know have kind of the the uh, you know any of the pump and dump mechanisms behind it and should be very kind of aligned to to how the community would vote and get incentivized for voting uh, unfortunately enough i don't see that enough today you know most of the 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 governance is actually centralized with a few wallets kind of you know voting and we've seen that right in some votes where uh kind of while it even while it's out for voting the decision has already been made you know by by some of the parties so i think uh the way to think about kind of investing in tokens is uh i just like to go early right because at that point the reality is like if the tokens are well known they become the valuations right now are very hard to kind of wrap your head around given that they they haven't really created those outsized value yet right and and most trade at a at a tvl or a fdv number which is again an inflated number and not really you know the the protocol revenue uh, and and you know sustainable revenue uh, that you know is a crude and and kind of uh, can actually power up you know returns for the investors so i think uh in terms of tokens uh, given that being late uh, right now means that you're at a very you know big valuation which right now i believe over over time will will reflect you know uh, what's happening in 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 the traditional kind of markets uh, but but going early means that you're now betting on teams that are you know invest you're investing at let's say 5 million or 10 million fdv uh, and let's say if you're the next big per uh, you know on arbitrum or if you're you know uh, kind of doing options on on optimism and these chains are really taking off i think there's outsized value to be created by those protocols given that you know they start with that ecosystem then they can you know go to multiple ecosystems and 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 kind of attract that so that's more in the defi space but other than that i think protocols will take a lot more time to build value right and uh, and a true value and that's why i think there'll be a massive consolidation of that over time versus you know there being thousands of tokens with you know some kind of value or liquidity fragmented across them yeah i see and and uh, i'm i'm going back to the power of the community here i feel like that community is extremely important when it comes to governance right <laughs> yes but it's also fickle right i mean communities are kind of you know moving around between one place to the other and, you know what i'm saying is 
the very few places where incentives are truly uh, aligned, right? Like, so in places where, you know, obviously you're staking the assets as an LP and getting some return, I think all of that kind of makes sense. But I think there are many situations where, you know, you're just kind of hoping that, uh, you know, the, the token takes off and hence you're participating. So I think with the community piece, like I said, I think you have, you have to really build organic and really good communities that align and actually hold a hold true ownership in the protocol and how it works. And I think those structures are still evolving and will take some time. Yeah, fair enough. Um, you mentioned TVL as well. Uh, TVL is uh, such an important metric for a lot of uh, high level stuff, such as you know understanding how much how many funds are in a specific protocol or in a pool. Um, and I really like that that you suggested other metrics along with TVL. Uh, what are your thoughts on TVL related metrics, such as TVL over market cap of a token, which can really pull out a lot of that uh, inherent price changes? But you know, are is TVL useful in other contexts, like when when matched with other types of metrics? Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great call and. I would also look at kind of, you know, remove wash trading. The reality behind TVL is it's a really hard metric. I mean, market makers can come and can come and make TVL, you know, grow 100x, you know, in no time. So I would look at a few things. I would look at the concentration of TVL, you know, who's actually creating it uh, in the sense that, you know, looking at TVL, let's say by, um, by active users or wallets, right? Uh, I would also kind of, you know, uh, uh, try to see if we can remove some sort of wash trading from the TVL, which obviously, you know, is, is really hard. Um, and then I think uh, over time, just seeing, you know, uh, where this TVL is coming from, you know, is it commensurate to the developer growth, social media growth, you know, protocol revenue, right? Which means that, you know, over time as the TVL grows, it's growing more organically and you're seeing indicators around it that, you know, it's growing in a healthy way. I think those are things that are kind of important because, uh, you know, um, um, yeah. Yeah, wash trading, that's a great call. Um, I've noticed a lot of the NFT platforms, once they introduce tokenomics, uh, there's absurd amount of wash trading, like looks rare when they lo launch looks, as well as blur uh, as they launch the blur token. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a great call out. How do you stay updated in this space there's just so much going on uh, how would you recommend somebody else to stay updated yeah i think uh i might have written about this uh, in the ultimate guide but i would say the best way to do this is you know in 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 two ways one is um you know to to read uh material out there that you know you're most interested in given that this is a red ocean right there's a there's like a hundred sub stacks and like you know everyone's writing about everything so I think just focusing on quality sources, which, you know, for me are Del Delphi Digital, Masari, you know, the block and some of those kind of OG sources, as well as consuming from some of the cri crypto, you know, Twitter, where, you know, I follow some of the folks like Balaji, you know, obviously, who recently are obviously, you know, off the rocker, but <laughs> but in general, you know, are, are kind of pillars of the industry. So, so just following the right folks on Twitter, uh, you know, um, I follow thesis of a lot of these funds that I respect. Uh, you know, uh, 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 so so reading up on that, reading up on you know Substack and use that as a subscribe to. So that's one uh, kind of big bucket. And obviously, the the thing is focus on the topics you actually like, right? Uh, like for example, even within DeFi, like focus on kind of let's say if you're more interested in indexes, or if you're more interested in kind of payments, that's one bucket. The second is kind of practical uh, application. So actually, go just don't read about stuff. Go actually do small kind of walkthroughs or demos or uh, actually try to build something, right? So uh, so try out test nets, you know, kind of try to kind of ship some small code if you can, you know, with chat GPT, you can actually kind of, you know, uh, um, compile your code easily and actually, you know, run it and create your own token on, on you know, uh, on one of these kind of remixers and, and whatnot. So, um, so I think uh, the second one, which is a practical application is even more important, right? Like trying out all the wallets that are out there, like a lot of the different things and having an having your own point of opinion, right? For example, if account abstraction is coming, what does that really mean? And how will these wallets work? And what is the real user benefit of it, right? Right now, like if I can choose to set account limits or pay gas or even ask you, hey, Chris, you're my friend, can you pay gas for me and, and do all of that stuff? I think uh, it's easy to kind of 
you know, read about it, but, you know, harder to kind of think how this would work from an experience point of view. So yeah, so if you're on a Gnosis safe user, go and onboard to that and see how some of these things work. I think that's the second piece that I advise people on, just go and try out a bunch of things to learn, you know, about Web2. Oh, totally. Yeah, I I suggest to uh, friends and family that that are trying to learn, you know, put like $100, $300 into a decentralized wallet, expect to lose it all, but try <laughs> as many things as you can. <laughs> Not, not have you hit that meme coin, right? So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so, w- w- one last question for you: What's uh, one thing that that we in the crypto community are not talking enough about, but really should be? Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I think uh, one thing that you know we are not talking maybe uh, a lot about is kind of the, the accrual of power that continues to happen to centralized parties, right? Like while decentralization is a big concept of crypto, I don't think we're, uh, you know, on an average, we talk enough or care enough about the level of concentration that's happened in different industries and how crypto can really still come in and, and you know, uh, help. For example, you know, it's been really crazy. You know, I just read this Twitter uh, that, you know, the three of the largest four bank failures have happened, you know, in our time in the last one week. And it's super quiet out there, right? If you look at news and otherwise, like, you know, people should be panicking and they're there right now could be a massive bank run on every regional bank out there. And US has like 10,000 plus community and regional banks, right? So, um, but but it isn't really happening. So so one thing we're not talking really about is, you know, what that is that erosion of trust that, you know, is happening with centralized parties, whether it's, you know, your government or whether it's, you know, large private players that, you know, seek uh, kind of, you know, unfair ways to to monopolize or, or monetize data. I think uh, once users or once, you know, companies kind of stress upon this enough, or, you, know, you know, we don't have to wait for black swan events, right, is what I'm saying. Like, you know, and obviously everyone waits for an inflection point as to, you know, something big has to happen for this erosion of trust and hence crypto movement. I feel like, you know, if there's a way to not wait for that moment and to actually have users kind of graduate towards owning more of their data, owning more of their kind of, you know, money, uh, right? And so that's one. And second is the US dollar itself, right? Like I worry a lot about the US dollar. I don't think people are talking enough about the debt ceiling and kind of the crisis that's coming, the currency crisis that's coming to the largest, you know, democracy in the world, uh, not largest democracy, the largest currency, uh, you know, reserve currency in the world. And what that really means is that if you talk about it enough, I think we kind of start understanding a little bit more about what Balaji is saying as to the flight to you know Bitcoin and Ethereum and why crypto is is going to you know be so seminal in the next hundred years, right? Uh, because you know we you can't just keep on printing money. And I think those are things that you know maybe people we are obviously in close circles, so we hear it a lot. But on an average, I don't think like enough people are talking about it. Yeah, that's a great call out. Um, totally agreed. Well, uh, Nicole, thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, there's just so much interesting content here, so much interesting uh, topics and things to think about. Um, I could really see us diving into each of these verticals that, that you've talked about in uh, in Cryptechy uh, at some point. I, I would love to follow up there. Um, yeah, that sounds great. Uh, it was great chatting with you also, Chris, and really appreciate you having me here. Yeah, thank you.